I'm Leslie O'Toole. I'm a journalist uh, based here in Los Angeles. I'm thrilled to introduce uh, John Asher, director, producer, and editor of the film. <laughs> and the astonishing 13-year-old Julian Feder, who of course is Poe. <laughs> and Christopher Gorman, who I'm sure you recognize from many projects, who is David, his father. I'd just like to start with a lighter aspect on the music because I think I was in tears within seconds of the start of the film because of the Burt Bacharach song, Close to You, which is so beautiful. And I just wondered if you had any personal connection with him and how you managed to snag that song. Uh, no, is this working? Oh, hi, everybody. Um, no, I met Burt by chance. Uh, I was uh, supposed to meet my son at Dave & Buster's in New York City. And when I showed up there, I called Jenny, and she was like, no, he's at Dave & Buster's in New Jersey. And I was like, <laughs> uh. So then I had to cancel my flight out of JFK, and I moved it to Newark. Uh, and then I saw my son briefly, and then I went to Newark to get on the plane. And um, they upgraded me, and I was sitting in pimpy first class. And this guy came in, and it was Burt Bacharach, oh, no and I had way. no idea. And... Uh, I had no idea who he was the entire flight. Um, he kept talking about a band that he had, and they <laughs> they'd travel, and I was like, yeah, okay. It was wild, wild. Um, and at the end of the flight, he gave me his number, and he wrote it on a, uh, on a napkin. And then uh, I called my mom, and I was like, who is this guy? And she's like, come on, you don't know who that you is? You really didn't know um, the name? No, I had no idea, but we had the commonality of, he wanted to know what I did for a living. I said, I'm a filmmaker, and I'm working on a movie about autism, and that's when we had this immediate bond. And um, he said, why don't you look, I have a library of songs, and why don't you look through some of them, see if you like something. And of course, I was like, are you kidding? Close to you was the first one that came to my mind, but raindrops keep falling on my head, what the world needs now, and the list goes on and on, and now I'm yep. thoroughly educated <laughs> <laughs> by this brilliant man, and, uh, and he gave me Close to You. And then when he saw a rough cut of the film, he said, uh, why don't you let me score the whole movie for you? So... There's, there it is. That's a, such a fantastic story. I couldn't have imagined. And while we're on the music, what about Billy Idol? Because obviously you, you weren't even born when Billy Idol was at the peak of his snarling pop power. Have you become a Billy Idol fan since? Because he's about to play at the Hollywood Bowl. And you know what, what is the Billy Idol story? Uh, I mean, so it was, it was um, I was supposed to, yeah, sing the song. And so, I mean, uh, John was saying, oh, we're going to have this Billy Idol song. I didn't know who that was. Um, I'd never heard the song. I mean, I'd heard the song on the, maybe before on the radio. It sounded familiar. So then I, uh, so then, yeah, I mean, sort of. It's a good song. <laughs> so were you the Billy fan then? Oh, totally. I went, my first concert was Billy Idol. No way. That's so yeah. cool. Yeah, my first ah! concert. Yeah, buddy. It was unbelievable. <laughs> Oh. Um, and I remember uh, rehearsing that uh, kind of lip sync with with the song and everything. And Julian was fantastic and got into it right away. So I can't tell. Can you guys always hear? Is this always on? All right, good. I feel like it goes in and out sometimes. You have um, to hold it close. It's just my Close to you. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Very clever. So obviously the casting is absolutely critical for this film. Was there ever a moment when you thought about playing the dad? Obviously you were an actor first and that was just too much, I'm guessing. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I love, I love the idea and notion of being an actor, director. I mean, Chris just directed himself in something. Yes. Um, I don't have that level of confidence, I don't think, to, to, as an actor to, be, to do a scene and be like, yep, that was good for me. And yeah. like, I just, like, I don't... I don't know how you do. I don't know how you do that. It's amazing. Like, I right, just I, always assume it's good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That makes sense. <laughs> See, that's good. That's. I don't have that. <laughs> um, so, so there was that, um, yeah. and I know I, the the role was too close to home for me, yes. and I didn't realize how close it was to home for Chris until we sat down and had a meeting, uh, and. I, I could share with everybody, yeah, that that his son also has autism. Oh, uh, I didn't so we, that. yeah, another bond, an instant yes. bond. Yes. And I was like, wow, this is um, 
And another guy who wanted to play the role of the father was Andrew Bowen. Uh, and I wish I had the video to show you guys. Uh, he's a brilliant actor. He sent me a message. His son, Reese, has autism. And he sent me a message, and he was in tears. We've been friends for a long time. And he said, please, you have to let me play the dad. And he was crying in this oh. video message to me. And I was like, dude, I it just, it's, I, I don't feel like you're my best friend. Like, I'm not going to be able to direct you, you know? I need an actor that I can direct that we have, um, there's no favoritism, nothing, yes. you know? And I wrote a role for him, and it ended up being the role of the janitor, the pirate, yes. and he that ended up playing. That's such a great It's really role. cool, and he did so a great, great, yeah. Yeah, great job. Yeah, yes. But when the script came to you, I mean, was it? purely a coincidence or did it come from someone who knew no, I mean I, I, we're, we're assuming that you know this uh John has a an autistic son also Evan um and his uh, ex-wife Jenny McCarthy has you know well the pair of them have worked very very hard and are you know huge advocates in the autism community and obviously further w with this film but but were you just randomly sent the script was it the universe just conspiring in your favor I think so. I think that's how everything happens, really. But I, I, I mean, we do have to make things happen ourselves. But I had just gone through a, a uh, I just gone through a divorce, so I was feeling sad and lonely, and I moved in with two guys, and I was gonna have roommates again at the age of thirty-five. I was cool. like, this is crazy. Yeah, kind of, but you know. <laughs> I also had a son that I was trying to yep. raise, uh, and and one of the guys happened to be uh, a guy by the name of Darby Parker, and he gave me this script called Poe, and I read it, and I started crying, and I used my money to option it, and I optioned it right away. But in that time period, I mean, that was 2005 when I got mm -hmm. the script. That's how long it took to get yep. this movie made, because people don't like to make movies like this anymore. I wish yep. they did, but it's really hard. Well, well uh, while you actually mentioned that, I was going to ask about the current climate because uh, a friend of mine's a producer on Speechless. I, I don't know if any of you have seen Speechless. It's about a, a non-verbal child. That's uh, obviously the title of the show. And I just wondered, you know, if you know popular culture is becoming more accepting of these sort of stories, and, and how important is it to get these sort of films and TV shows out there to educate people who don't know? I think it's very important. I think that there are so many different aspects of autism on the spectrum. Um, it's becoming so vast now that it's as individual as everyone sitting in this room. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to understand the signs and uh, the acceptance of it and not to be scared when you see it. That's kind of why I made this film is um, just, you know, for me it was a growth experience. This is like a love letter to my son and mm -hmm. to let him know that I understand what he's going through. But I didn't make this movie for families that have children with autism because they already, they're living this. Exactly. I yes. made this for people that have neurotypical Absolutely. children so they can learn something yes. and, and see what's going on. But I do think, to answer your question, that the mass media and mainstream media is starting to get it now and, mm -hmm. and they're starting to click in. There's a new show on Netflix. Atypical, oh, yes. yeah. Yes. So I think that I think that's a good sign right there. Yes. So Christopher, how did the script come to you, and how important was it for you to play this role then? Given well, you know, the I I assumed that it came to me because John had read that I had a son that had autism. Um, so I was actually really shocked when we sat down to to, to have coffee, and uh, it turned out that was not the case at all. Um, so that was just kind of um, you know a weird bit of kismet. Um, because when I read it, um, you know, I mean, I had the similar experience that John had reading it the first time, I'm sure. Just, I, I just, n I knew exactly what this was. Like I've, you know, my life is not the same as David's life in the movie, but, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of it is very familiar. Um, and really the one scene that convinced me that, that this was going to work, um, and, and that more than that was that convinced me that John was going to do it right and do a great job was the scene where David loses his temper, mm -hmm. um, you know, and just completely loses it in front of his kid. Um, because that's the scene that proves um, that we're being honest. Um, to have that moment where y you're really ashamed of your behavior. Um, but it's human, and, and, you know, everybody goes through moments like that, and it's, I think it was important to show it. So... Um, I mean, that was really the, the thing when I was reading it where I thought, okay, yeah, I want to do this.
Well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, it, yeah. it is a very human story. And even a scene like that, any of us who is a parent, you know, yeah. we have lost it on our child like yeah. that, you know, no, no matter who they are. And I, I think that's the beauty of the film. It, it transcends, yeah. you know, any special needs aspect there is. So, so who did you cast first of these two? Uh, I cast Julian yeah, first. I think yeah. Would. Um, and well, how, how difficult a search was that? Because obviously this is an extraordinary performance. He's he's already won six awards for this film. Yeah. Hey. Um, so so I mean, what did you think when you got the script, Julian? I mean, it's uh, a massive challenge for anybody. Yeah, it was it was really interesting because it was you know um, playing. You, She's very different to play. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, it was it was it was very it, it was very interesting to play because it wasn't like anything that you know n you normally play, and so it was it was a lot of fun to to do the part, and um, it was it was challenging, but it sort of it, it was it was just really interesting how we prepared for the part and. Um, like John and I, for example, would play games like Monopoly, but I'd have to stay in character, any sort of board game, et cetera. And, um, and then we, would, uh, we met some kids uh, at a place called the Help Center, and uh, we just took all these different, like, um, all these different, like, aspects, or I don't know exactly. Talking about the physicalities? Yeah, physicalities yeah. Of, of, the, of the people we met, and just in general and we put it in all to make the character. So it's like a collection of a bunch of different people. I mean, the physicality is such a huge part of the role, and I think it's so impressive. How, I mean, you immediately notice the way you, you know, carry your hands, for example, and the fact that you maintain that so beautifully through the whole film is phen phenomenal, I think. I mean, what, what was the most difficult part for you? Um, uh, I guess kind of creating the character, but once you sort of, once the character was sort of created, then it became more natural to just do it every, uh, when you're doing it, uh, you just kind of, you just go on set and then you just sort of do it. And so definitely creating the character would be the most challenging part. And then what about you, Christopher? How did you develop that father-son relationship? Because I mean, it, it's so beautiful and absolutely realistic. In Thank you. Um, yeah, we, uh, you know, I, I'm a dad. I've been a dad for a long time. So it's um, it's funny. This is this is one of the roles that I, I've had to do the least extra research on, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, I, I just I know what that's like. Um, I don't know what it's like to lose your wife, but I, but I but I know what it's like to love your kid, and to um, so completely um, that feeling like you're failing him is almost a debilitating disease, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and working with Julian just made it really easy because, you know, he and John had been working, I mean, you guys have been working for almost a year. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he started, he thoroughly worked on it for a couple of months, but he didn't, I mean, the crazy thing is that I was, guess, I want to talk about how I found him, but I don't want to cut you off either. No, 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 so. yeah, I mean, but just being like, like uh, uh, you know, and, and also my son, is is much higher functioning typically than than Poe in the movie. So like my relationship with my son's different than my relationship with Poe in the film. But um, but it just came very naturally. It was just um, you know uh, Julian. I mean particularly for such a young guy um, was just fantastic and always just very present and just in character and um, uh, it, it made my job easy. So you said earlier it was difficult to get a film like this made, obviously. How did you finally get it made? I mean, was there some turning point? Was it finding Julian? Was he the key? I think uh, finding the kid had a lot to do with it. That was going to be the hard part. Um, and also getting a neurotypical child to play the role because in his imagination he was typical. So this was mm -hmm. the flipping back and forth. Um, I knew that I was that was going to be an insane search. You know, I was like, "How am I going to find this kid?" And like, yeah. and and it's got to be the right timing. And I had two. I guess they're called angel investors. Is that what they're called? And and it's from two separate sources, but they want to remain anonymous. And these people are phenomenal that do these type of things. I didn't know they existed. 
but they exist and it's real. Um, it's the movie. But um, to this day, I mean, I, you know, I keep thanking them left and right and hope that they'll step forward and be like, it was us, but they won't do it. Um, but that's the cool thing about it. But I, but, but I, I found Julian right about this, almost the same time the timing happened. I was struggling to get the movie financed. I knew it was going to be re-optioned by another company, so I had the option on it. Um, and I was guest speaking in an acting class. It's crazy. This is why it's good to go to acting class, guys, because I was guest speaking still. I know there's a lot of adults out here. We go to acting class. Um, <laughs> the best ones do. But, right, Chris? <laughs> so, acting class? I'm oh, sorry. I wasn't listening. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> Just like a working actor. <laughs> okay. But anyways, I was speaking in an acting class. And in comes this kid with a, a pair of jeans on and cowboy boots and like a, a Japanese silk robe top and a funny little hat on. And it, the, what embraced me, uh, what I loved about that energy is he didn't care what anybody thought about him. And that's what I loved about Poe and all children with autism. Autism, They don't care what we think about them, funny enough. It's you guys and us and... Yep society that has this weird impression of them, but they don't care. I mean, my son came home the other day from his first day in high school, and this is where you learn how to put your ego in check, but he came home and he was like, Dad, guess what? Me and Jack, we have our own table at lunch. Now, to you guys, you're thinking, ah, oh, it's so sad, but in Evan's mind, he's like, that's the coolest thing in the world. So that's the part that I want to embrace, and I love that this kid came in, and he had this great energy, and he didn't care what anybody thought about him, and I contacted his parents right away, and I said, I'm, I have a movie that might be right for your kid. I'm not sure, but I don't even know if this kid can act yet. He's really good at improv. I don't know what's going on. And great, great, great. And then I get a call from his parents saying, listen, he has an audition next week. Would you mind coaching him? And I was like, I'm an, I'm a director. Like, I'm going to coach this kid. <laughs> I was like, all right. So then I go and I meet the kid and he's got 12 pages of dialogue. This is it's so brutal that they do this to people the day before. <laughs> It's torture, and it's like four <laughs> scenes, and it's like memorize them all. We'll let you know which ones we want. So, like, come on, like, so the facts comes through. I said, let me look at it real quick. I'm like highlighting it, circling it, trying to figure out what his character is. And then I look up, and I was like, "You ready?" And he's like, "Yeah." And he slides the sides across the table to me. I'm like, "What?" And he had all twelve pages memorized in like four and a half minutes. And he had all the subtleties and all the beats. The, the, one of the cool things about Julian as he sits here quietly, he's very much like Matthew Broderick. In the, because I met Matthew Broderick after a brilliant play, Biloxi Blues. And he did this huge performance, and then I went to shake his hand, and he was like, hi, nice to meet you. Julian's a shy guy, but he's a brilliant actor. When the camera's rolling, the second I say action, he can transform. So that's a compliment to him. <laughs> Was there anything in particular you wanted to add that was personal for you and your son that wasn't in the script? I mean, obviously the, you know, the the hugging scene at the end. Um, I know that uh, Jenny McCarthy, you know, wrote a book about Evan and their journey with him, and talks about when he was watching an episode of SpongeBob and you know wasn't react hadn't been reacting at all, and then all of a sudden giggled like crazy at a joke and then gave her a hug. So I was just wondering, you know, if that was a scene that, that you might have added. I mean, I mean, I love that scene. I think yep. there's a lot of uh, touch issues with the kids because of their high sensory. Yes. Um, and you have to, you, you, you have to like grow them into that, um, being comfortable, being held. And, and, and you know, in the beginning of the movie, he's like soft touch, bad, hard touch, good. And I like to be felt. Yes. Um, yeah, there were different, there were a lot of things in the script that hit home with me, but it's Colin Goldman's, you know, writing of, this, yes. of the story. And Steve Roberts, um, it's based on a true story. I mean, the movie's based on a true story. This guy really lost his wife from cancer, and he was, is a single dad and mm -hmm. raised his autistic child who we met at the Newport Beach Film Festival. Yeah. Aww. And uh, it's, it's his real story. So there all, we have a lot of similarities uh, in there. But... There was nothing, I tried to get as much of Evan in there. I think, you know, um, I think the constipation thing is a real thing that happens with lots of autistic kids. He was so brave to do that. Yeah. He did not want to do that. I bet. But I it, bet. <laughs> who, who wants to do that when you're, I think you were 12 years old. Yes. Who wants to do that with a crew? Like, yeah. you know, everybody's wants. But How did they get you to do that, Julian? <laughs> he's a pro. Yeah. <laughs> mm. 
Yeah, I mean, it was just sort of, uh, it was just kind of awkward. Just like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With like but thank you for doing it because yeah. you're in creep. You know, that's people need to know what were, what what was going on. That's the yep. reality of it. Yeah. yeah. What well, what was most difficult for you, Christopher? I mean, my biggest concern. I kept going to John and was like, I, I, "Listen, when you cut this movie, just make sure I'm not crying in every scene." <laughs> You know, like, help me moderate this because literally, I mean, I felt like every day I was coming away from work. <laughs> I did think you had obviously real tears in this. I do think yeah. you can tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, um, well, listen, I mean, some of that, uh, look, good, the good writing always makes the acting so much easier, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and those emotional scenes in particular, I just think, just ring true. Um, so that makes makes that easy um, to to pull off, but but emotionally, yeah, I was tired. I was tired. It was um, it wasn't an easy thing to do, um, but it's something I really wanted to do. Yeah, I lost a very close friend to cancer uh, who left behind very young children. I thought it was going to be a much tougher f watch than it was. Were you intentionally trying not to be too schmaltzy? Because you know, I, I like the fact that you know we we don't even see a photo of your wife as she was until almost the end of the film. We see a photo on your nightstand where she's wearing a, a head, headscarf. Um, but was that intentional? You know, n I mean, you know, it could have been much more emotional in that aspect than it was. And, you know, it could have been too much. Yeah, I mean, that's a, f it's a fine line emotions, right? You mm -hmm. know, uh, it's all left up to interpretation. Mm -hmm. And cutting the movie together was a hard choice for me to do, to edit this film. It's the mm -hmm. first film I've ever cut together by myself. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I just sat in my place and I was like, here we go. Yep. And boy, I went into the rabbit hole. You know, you disappear yep. and you come back and you're like, I mean, I have such respect for editors. I mean, these guys yeah. that just uh, create and assemble a story and tell a story. Um, to answer your question, it was a fine line to ride that line. I wanted to to make a good movie, a movie that was entertaining and educates you at the same time. Um, but I'll tell you, it's funny, we were talking about this downstairs, and I'm not giving this guy any props. I wish I had his name so you guys could all write him a letter. But you said the movie wasn't, I love you right now so much, because well, this it guy... It is, this but, guy, it, but it could have been much I'm, more schmaltzy than it is. I'm about to share is. something yes. with you. <laughs> what I'm sharing with you is that we got a review, a horrible review on the movie. And this guy ripped it to pieces he just ripped it to pieces. He was like, it's too schmaltzy. Uh, yeah. He said, he said, it's uh, overall the word. He was like, it's like, you, you didn't get to read it yet, but it's, and maybe get to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah. exciting. But yeah. this guy, it's funny wait. about yeah, the yeah. critics, you know, you never yes. know what somebody's going to say, but this guy yeah, yeah. really ripped it apart. Um, I'm going to get him back. Don't worry about it. But he was like, you know, he was just, <laughs> it's just like, I just wonder if he like, just, I mean, maybe he had an upset stomach or a bad childhood. Yeah, I don't know what was going on. So yeah, some constipation, you, you're saying it yeah. wasn't too schmaltzy, yeah, no, but he wasn't. was saying it was. Um, no, no, no. I mean, it was schmaltzy in, in the right way, but it you know, wasn't too much. Good. It was beautiful. Good. Um, I've got a question from the audience um, from Heidi. I mean, she she wants to know what, what challenges did you face getting the film made, which Where's we have Heidi? covered in part. Oh, hi, Heidi. Heidi's um, hiding. <laughs> How appropriate. Yeah. Um, but was there anything in particular that you wanted to show or cover in the film that you weren't able to? I mean, presumably there must have been some beautiful stuff you had to leave on the editing room floor. Uh, well, uh, you know, I, I got away with a lot on this movie. Um, you know, we shot the movie for half a million dollars. I don't know if you guys are aware wow. of that. Um, and, you know, all those locations up in, well, I don't know where we were, way up in Northern California. We stole all that stuff. Yep. We just literally like dressed a guy in a pirate uniform and threw him on the beach and yep. started shooting. There's happened to be a pirate ship parked out there. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but, that was lucky. Uh, yeah, very lucky. Uh, and then the the, uh, the knight in shining armor, that was on 18 mile drive, you know, where Pebble Beach is. We yeah. literally pulled to the side of the road and I was like, look at all these trees. And we just started <laughs> shooting. So we got away with a lot. I, I, I don't know if there's anything missing. I, I, I guess if I had more money, I would do... I had this one... Okay, I'll tell you one cool thing. That's a great question. I had this one idea that would be cool to... If I had all the money in the world, or not even that much, a couple million, I would build Poe's room and I would have the walls fold down and you would be in whatever location he was dreaming oh, about. Yeah. That would yes. be yeah, great. All right, we got to go back and shoot. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but that's what I totally would like stuff like that. I think you can really you do. I like stuff to be as much uh, on camera as possible. Uh, they, we do so much digital work nowadays. It's cool to do stuff mm -hmm. on camera. Absolutely. Um, that's a great question. Who else asked questions? A few. Uh, we've got a question right. from Beth now. Is Beth here? Hi, Hi Beth. Hi. Beth, you're Hi. making a sweater. What are you doing? Uh, oh, that's awesome. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's for Chris. Um, you recently directed your first movie. We love you, Sally Carmichael. How was it making the transition from acting to directing and uh, you know, directing yourself? And as a father, <laughs> if your children wanted to follow you into the business, yeah. uh, what would your advice be to them? Um, that's a lot. Yep. Um, <laughs> all right. No, that's okay. Um, I would say um, I... Uh, it's it's I, I've, it's not the first time I've directed myself. I, I directed myself in a few episodes of Covert Affairs, um, so I. But a movie's quite a different. Well, the process. thing about the movie's a much bigger, longer process. The actual on-set stuff of directing myself, mm -hmm. very much the same. Right. Um, but that's that's why I would say the movie was a much more satisfying experience than directing the episodes of TV. Um, and honestly, uh, I was really inspired by the job that John did on this movie um, because, no, it's true. <laughs> honestly, it's true because I, I had done four, yep. <laughs> I want to say four <laughs> or five other like little indie films like this with mm -hmm. small budgets um, over the past couple of years. Um, they were always first time, usually writer directors, um, and it was not... They were not great experiences, and I found myself having to come in and co-direct the movie as well as do my thing without, and it was just a mess. And I felt like my performance suffered, and um, doing Poe uh, was the first like little indie film that I had done where I, I didn't have to worry about any of that. Um, you know, like I could just do my acting job and knowing that the director knew what he was doing and knew what he wanted and I didn't have to think about it. I could just focus. And I think um, it's one of the reasons why I'm so happy with my performance in the movie. Um, and so I really tried to take that into my directing job on We Love You, Sally Carmichael um, and be that kind of director for the rest of my cast. Um, so, uh, you know, and the movie turned out great. I'm re I was really happy with it. But, um, but really, I, it's, it's, you know, uh, um, John was a real inspiration on that. Um, and as far as my kids, thankfully, my, yeah, it's true. I'll hire you it's again. True, buddy. <laughs> I promise. Yeah, I'm sure you will. No, that's fine. <laughs> it's fine. He just finished another movie and didn't hire me, so. Yeah. <laughs> mm, it's fine. I was probably busy. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. Julian's in the movie. It's yeah, like, it's, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> but as far as my kids, you know, my I, I have three kids. I have uh, two boys and, and a girl. My oldest, Lucas, is is the one who has Asperger's, and um, and he and his brother Ethan have no desire whatsoever to be in the business. My daughter, however, <laughs> was literally last week in tears. Oh. <laughs> Why can't I be in the movie? Oh. Like I want to be like. So she's a problem <laughs> um, that I'm I'm dealing with. Yeah. So we'll see we'll see how that turns out. Can you just tell us a little about what your movie is about? Uh, yeah, my uh, my film uh, is uh, is a totally family friendly little independent comedy about a writer named Simon Hayes who is so ashamed uh, that of having written this incredibly successful series of young adult romance novels about a young woman who falls in love with a merman that he wrote them under the pen name Sally Carmichael. And at the beginning of the movie, he's forced to meet with this big movie star who's in talks to play Lexander the Merman in the movie version of his books. And that meeting becomes the catalyst that basically, you know, ruins his life and reveals his true identity to the world. And um, uh, it's, you know, it's this just really fun, sweet little comedy. And then you two made another film, I Hate Kids, um, where a lifelong bachelor, Tom Everett Scott, discovers that he's your father. Can you talk a little about that? And presumably you were just so blown away by Julian, you just had to have him back again. And it would have been weird to have both of you in the same movie again, wouldn't See, it? See, I told it you. Been bizarre. That's okay. <laughs> 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 It's so weird that the title of my next film after this is I Hate Kids. It's yeah. the weirdest. 
thing ever, but we did. We got we we got Tom Everett Scott. You may have heard of him before. Nice young actor. Nope. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> And well, Titus, an actor, Titus I Burgess. He's never quite earned his due. He's phenomenal. I yeah, I know. He's great. He's great. And he's hilarious in this film. And I'm in the middle of cutting it. I'm, I'm three weeks into editing right now. Uh, so, so young Julian uh, plays Mason, who is his son. And he shows up at his wedding rehearsal and no. Ian says, you got to help me find my mom. But he, but the dad can't let the bride-to-be know that he has a son. And Titus Burgess plays a psychic with a with a with a dog mm -hmm. that sees <laughs> into the future. No, I've really no. I, it's a whole it's not Poe. Uh, it's a totally <laughs> it's a totally different film. It's a comedy. It's a family comedy. It's it's ridiculous and fun and we had Marissa Tomei in there and we had Ray Seahorn from Better Call Saul and um, uh, Rachel Boston and it's a, it's a phenomenal cast and this kid is again amazing and funny. Believe it or not, you're so funny. That's crazy. Yeah. 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 You can't wait for you guys to see it. Yeah. You obviously noticed that Julian's a little bit taller than he was in the movie. Uh, we were just talking earlier. Can you just talk about that beautiful hugging scene at the end and how, you know, he was growing through the shoot? Well, I was terrified. I mean, literally, I think he grew four inches in the what, four weeks that we were shooting this movie. <laughs> <laughs> and the scene on the beach was it? The, it was the last day of production, and I'm watching this kid grow and grow. Throughout, and I'm thinking, I am not going to be able to lift him up over my head. I got him up. <laughs> I got him up, but I couldn't do it today. I tell you that much. It was great hearing Chris like during the take. It's, we took it out, obviously, but you hear him go, <gasps> and he lives. He just, uh, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> It's true. He's. I mean, we shot that film last April, so here we are now, and you're a foot taller. That's you're as tall as your dad. You're taller than your dad now. You're tall. Where is your dad? I'm that. Yeah. You I'm are I'm taller. Tall. He's he's somewhere over there. Um. Uh, yeah, man. Awesome. Thank you guys for coming. Yep. I mean, you guys are freaking amazing. And all is everybody here like an actor? Is that the deal? You're all actors. All actors. This is so, so somebody shaking their head. No. Okay, cool. Yeah. But most of you are <laughs> actors, right? This is so cool. I'm so proud of you guys for coming. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, everyone. Thank you.